ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا وسيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله عن عائشة رضي الله تعالى عنها قالت كان النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا أراد أن يعتقف صلى صلاة الفجر ثم دخل معتقفه وأمر بالخباء خباء فضرب فاستأذنت زينب أن تضرب أو يضرب لها الخباء فأذن لها ثم استأذنت حفصة ثم عائشة فلما أصبح النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم رأى الأخبية حول المسجد فقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم لمن هذه الأخبية فقالوا هذه لأزواجك لزوجاتك فأمرهن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فاجتمعت فقال لهن آل بر تردن وترك الاعتكاف واعتكف الأول من شوال العشر الأول من شوال عائشة رضي الله تعالى عنها is very you know this particular hadith will clarify something that happened in a later incident but it shows how a man should always be conscious of the fact that his wife is doing the things that she does for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not for him as a husband. As many times women in their attempt to please their, their spouse, their husband, they tend to do things, although we know that the ultimate goal behind it is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but the immediate goal is to satisfy and please their husband. But when it comes to acts of worship, comes to Tawheed, belief in creed, their belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the husband should not even be a part of the equation. And it is our responsibility as husbands to nurture our women upon doing things for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not because I told you so. Don't clean the home because you want to please me. Clean the home because you want your reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't wear hijab. As you have many young women, they don't wear hijab. Or they wear the, the headscarf, but they don't wear an overgarment. And then immediately, as soon as they get married, they put on the hijab. I'll put it on. They even tell themselves, I will wear the hijab once I get married. Because you know that your husband is not going to tolerate you coming in and out of the home without the hijab on. So you end up doing it for the sake of your husband instead of for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when we notice that our wives are doing this, it is our responsibility to give them the tarbiyah, to give them that nurturing and that culturing to make sure that they, their hearts are in the right place and doing it for the right reason. Aisha radiallahu she said that the Prophet sallallahu when he wanted to perform i'tikaf during the month of Ramadan, the last 10 days of Ramadan, he would pray Salatul Fajr at the masjid and then he would go to the area of the masjid where he was going to perform i'tikaf. That is the sunnah of the Prophet as it relates to i'tikaf. Pray Fajr and then remain in the masjid from that first night, that first morning of the first 10 days, the last 10 days of Ramadan. So she said that he would have a tent pitched for him in the masjid. And the scholars, they explained to show that the permissibility of uh, isolating yourself in a particular area of the masjid and designating that place for yourself to isolate yourself from the rest of what's going on in the masjid. So you're using the masjid as a place of isolation from the world and you're using your tent in the masjid to isolate yourself from what's going on inside the masjid. SubhanAllah This is that, that moment that is between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and no one else. So Aisha said that the Prophet ﷺ had a tent in the masjid. Then Zainab, his wife Zainab, came and asked permission to pitch a tent in the masjid also. And he gave her permission to do so. And this also establishes or one from the proofs to show that it is permissible for the women to perform i'tikaf in the masjid. So as long as it doesn't, you know, uh, you know 
uh, end up in her neglecting some of her, you know, domestic responsibilities like taking care of children and, you know, things like this. But it is permissible for women to perform anti so as long as they have a place that is particular for them. As for the masjid where there is no separation between the men and the women, then this would not be permissible because women have to sleep on the floor in the masjid and it's not permissible for, you know, them to be seen like that. So if the women have an isolated place, a place designated specifically for women, then yes, it is permissible, so as long as they get the permission of their husbands. So Zainab, she sought permission from the Prophet Sallallahu to perform anti -cap. He gave her permission. She pitched the tent in the masjid. Then Hafsa, the wife of the Prophet Sallallahu saw that Zainab had a tent, so she decided, I want to perform anti too. You see where this is going. Right? They're vying to be close to the Prophet ﷺ. If they know that he's going to be in the masjid, then I'm going to perform anti kath with him also, so I can be close to him. They never missed an opportunity, subhanAllah, to be close to their husbands. You know, where today we might say, you know, honey, I'm going to the masjid. She's saying in the back of her mind, I hope you never come back. Right? You know, they had a closeness with him, and, and they wanted to be around him, even when he married Um Salama, radiallahu ta'ala and he gave her her three days, and then when he was on his way out the door, she grabbed the back of his thobe to pull him back. She didn't want him to leave. And the Prophet ﷺ turned around and said to her, In shitti la sabatuki wa in sabatuki sabatu li bakiyata zawjati. That if you want, I can give you seven days, but if I give you seven days, I have to give the rest of my wives seven days. And she let his shirt go, because she understood what that meant. You know, that meant that she would not see him again for another maybe a month or so, month or two. So the point that I'm making is that um, Hafsa went and pitched a tent in the masjid. When Aisha saw Hafsa pinch a tent in the masjid, she wanted to put a tent in the masjid to perform it to cap. So when the Prophet said him praise Salatu Fajr, he saw all of these tents in the masjid. And he asked the Sahaba, whose tents are these? Like, who is pitching all of these tents in the masjid? They said, those are your wives' tents. So he realized what was going on. You know, they were vying or competing with one another, but for the wrong reason. So he called all of his wives and he asked them, Are you doing this out of righteousness? Are you doing this for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Are you vying with one another for me? And so he removed himself from the equation and he said, you know what? I'm not even going to perform anti kaf this year. He took his tent down and he left out of the masjid. And he didn't perform anti kaf until the next month, the month of Shawal, the first 10 days of the month of Shawal, and he performed anti kaf during that time. Which shows us the permissibility of performing anti kaf in any month. In any month. Especially if you take an oath to do something and you say, you know, if this happens, I'm going to stay in the masjid for a week. You know, you can, if you take an oath to do that, then you can perform anti kaf at any time. It doesn't necessarily have to be a Ramadan. But the point that I'm making is that when he asked his wives, are you doing this out of righteousness? Or are you doing this for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And this is a husband chastising his wife and reprimanding her for doing things not for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but for his sake. Competing and when you see that you are a part of the equation when it comes to people in their relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala You remove yourself from the equation You do not put yourself as a wedge in between the person and their worship to their creator subhanahu wa ta'ala And this is Tawheed Fast forward Let me show you how this works The end result of this When Aisha radiallahu was being accused of zina, of adultery and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed those verses from Surah An-Nur, you know, exonerating her and clearing her of these accusations. Aisha's mother, Umm Ruman, she said to Aisha, Kummi ya Aisha ila Rasulillah. She said, Oh Aisha, get up and go thank the Messenger of Allah. Meaning, thank him for Allah, you know, revealing those verses, exonerating you. Meaning, you know, putting the Prophet ﷺ in the equation. Meaning, had not the Prophet asked Allah to reveal those verses, you would have still been the accused one. So get up and go thank him for imploring Allah for revealing those verses, exonerating you. Aisha radiallahu she said, La wallahi la akumu ilahi abadan. 
La ashkur illallah. She said, no mother, I swear by Allah, I will never get up and go thank him. He had nothing to do with this. I only thank Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look at how that played out. And this is what happens when you teach your family ikhlas. They even turn on you, which is a good thing, alhamdulillah, because they are using what you taught them. She said, no, I'm not going to get up and go thank him. Thank him for what? I only thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. لا أشكر إلا الله. I only thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He had nothing to do with this. I only thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I will never get up and go thank him. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you would think at that moment, person being vulnerable, you know, person hurt, broken because of this situation, that they would have that type of gratitude, but she never lost sight of the fact that it was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the very beginning. From the very beginning. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a'lam. But ikhlas, I can't stress that enough. It is a very important component that is a necessary part of the believer and that our deeds are not accepted without it. And we have to make sure that we train ourselves to constantly be in sync with this particular component of ikhlas. As one of the scholars of the past, Sufi al Thodi, he said, Ma alaj tu shaykhin ashadda alayya min niyati li anha tataqallabu alayya. I have never, you know, remedied something. I have never provided a remedy for something that was so difficult than my heart because it is constantly turning on me. This is what the word qalb means. Qalb yuqallibu. Qalb means to, to change, to turn. When you say you want to turn a page, you say, iqlib ashirit or iqlib. Uh, the, the page turned you use the word qalb and that is the same word for the heart the heart is constantly changing meaning you have to constantly constantly check your intention check why you're doing things constantly and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a'lam wa sallallahu ala nabiyya muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam wa taslim al kathira wa akhir da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh